Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's Casual Friday podcast, I have tidbits, I have an update on my reverse engineered sweater in progress and some updates on my planned 1970s vintage sweater, which is part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So let's get started. This tidbit was sent to me by email uh, from Rhea. She is a member of our guild. She lives up in Canada. She comes to our knit nights that we do via Zoom. So I've gotten to know Rhea fairly well uh, over the past couple of years. She sent me a story, a newspaper story about a, the headline says knitted, it's crocheted topper for a letterbox in celebration of Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee. So the story was from an Ely newspaper. So it surprised me <laughs> to see that someone would have yarn bombed a letterbox like that here in Minnesota. So Ely is a town in northern Minnesota near the boundary waters that divide Canada from Minnesota. And it's a little tiny town uh, and it just seemed weird to me. And then I actually read the story and realized it was not from Ely, Minnesota, but it was from a town with the same name in the UK. I don't know if they pronounce it the same. I don't know if they pronounce it Ely, which is how we pronounce it here. But regardless, I'll leave a link down in the show notes if you're interested in seeing what the crocheted uh, topper looks like. Rhea sent me two more tidbits this past week and they're related to each other. The first one is a documentary called Why Wool Matters produced by the Campaign for Wool. So I'm gonna to link to the video down in the show notes. I think it's around 18 or 20 minutes long. The description for the video is this, against a background of misleading anti-wool lobbying currently orchestrated by global giants of fast fashion, the campaign for wool decided to engage with leading academic experts in the field of land management and carbon sequestration to demonstrate the positive pastoral contribution the grazing of ruminants, particularly sheep, makes to the continued well-being of the planet. These peer-reviewed findings add to already well-documented research revealing wool's unique renewable and biodegradable end-of-life attributes and the contribution the fiber makes to the circular economy. The film targets the general consumer as well as environmental experts, farmers, the trade, retail buyers, educational networks, and influencers. The aim is to find ways of reaching a wide audience and informing opinions. So I'll leave a link to that video down in the show notes. So I mentioned that Rhea had sent me two tidbits that were related to each other, and this is the second one. It's related to that documentary I just told you about. This is an article that includes a video that's just a couple of minutes long. It's about a Canadian needle felting artist who did a wool bust of Prince Charles in celebration of the 10th anniversary of the campaign for wool in Canada. So Prince Charles is the, is the patron of the campaign for wool. So that's why those two things are related. But the video within this article that I'll link to explains what her process is for creating these needle felted sculptures, and then uh, also a bit about how she did this specific piece. So again, I'll leave a link down in the show notes. This tidbit showed up in my Twitter feed yesterday. It is a video of Ukraine's President Zelensky. He was wearing this green embroidered shirt and he gave a very uh, short comment um, about the what was significant about the date, which was May 18th. So May 18th is, Vish I'm gonna try to pronounce this, Vishavanka Day in Ukraine. So Vishavanka translates to embroidery. So embroidery has been a part of Ukraine identity and culture for several thousand years. Vishavanka Day was begun by a student back in 2006 
and it spread to become an international day of cultural identity for Ukrainians around the world. So I'll link to a Wikipedia article down in the show notes about Vishavanka Day, as well as a link to the tweet of President Zelensky wearing his, sh his embroidered shirt in honor of Vishavanka Day. This tidbit came to me from Louise, who sent me a link to a blog post on Anne Kingston's website about Victorian knitted boot uppers with leather soles. So I don't know if, if any of you watched The Great British Sewing Bee, but I think it was the first week of the season where the contestants had to make a pair of high top sneakers. So they were provided the, the rubber soles and then they had to make the uppers and then hand sew them to these sneaker soles. So those knitted boots reminded me a little bit of that concept. I've certainly seen knitted slippers sewn to suede soles before, but I've never seen knitted fabric sewn to a hard leather shoe sole before. I think they're, they're pretty cool. So I'll leave a link to um, the blog post down below so you can read a little bit more about it. If you have any tidbits that you'd like to share, you can send them to me via email or via a direct message on Ravelry, or you can uh, tweet at me if you have something. I try to share all the tidbits that are sent to me. So if you've sent um, me a tidbit recently that I haven't shared, it's more than likely that I'm saving it um, until I have a week when I don't have very many uh, tidbits to share. So I really appreciate all of the sharing of tidbits and thank you so much for passing those along. Last week, I was up to the underarm of my reverse engineered sweater of the right front, and I wanted to wash and block it before I continued with the shaping for the upper part of the body, just to confirm that my row gauge was accurate and also that I was getting the actual finished width that I wanted for that um, piece. So I confirmed everything was okay, and I went ahead and I did all of the shaping for the right front, and I will show you that in a bit. I have since then started working on the back of the sweater. I think there are somewhere between six and seven repeats of the cable pattern that go up the back, and I'm in somewhere into the, the third one. So I'm about a third of the way through the back, so I expect I'll be finished with that by this time next week. As I mentioned last week, this project has presented some challenges to me over the past couple of years that caused me to never really get started on it. So I wanna give you a closer look at what those challenges were and where I am in the sweater at the moment in terms of solving those challenges. So this is the sweater that I am reverse engineering. There are some changes that I wanted to make from the very beginning, and I've changed my mind about some of those, and I'll explain why. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to change was the fact that all of the cables in the entire sweater were crossing to the right. When I look at this V-neck, because the V-neck sweater is moving away from the center in opposite directions, but the cables are crossing in the same direction, and so, this crossing right here that's going into the neck looks very different over here where it's coming away from the neck. So what I wanted to do was mirror those so that both of them went into the neck. Another change I wanted to make was to continue the crossings uh, as I went up to the shoulder. So when you have these vertical panels of whether it's cables or lace, when you are doing shaping so that you're reducing the number of stitches that you have, you have a choice typically where you can just switch it to stockinette. As soon as you have, you don't have enough stitches to do the stitch pattern, you just switch it. Or you can try to maintain the stitch pattern as long as possible. So what I want like to do with cable crossings when there's a V-neck involved is to continue the cable crossing at least for a little bit. So even though the cable crossing might be shorter right here, it, it will interrupt this very long span of stockinette. Now there's another cable here, um, a full cable right here, and one of the things that I was thinking about doing, which is something I typically do, is have a final cable crossing very near the shoulder. 
what that does is it, it helps to keep, you know, maintain the width of this seam line. And also what I tend to, to do after a final crossing is to reduce the stitch count down to what it would be if this had been all knit in stockinette because you always have more stitches in a span uh, that is a certain width. You'll have more stitches if it's a cabled fabric because cables will pull the fabric in. So if you have a cable crossing and then you just have switched to stockinette along the seam line, the seam ends up a lot wider than it would have been um, all the way up to that point and it, wider than it would have been if it were all in stockinette. So that's called cable flare. So those were a couple of changes that I wanted to make. There was a few others. I certainly did make the decision and stuck with it to mirror the cables on the two fronts. And let me show you what I've got so far. So you can see that I added that additional cable crossing. It's shorter and I added that now I'm up to here. Now the, the shoulder is another inch to inch and a half in length. So I haven't yet done the shoulder shaping up here. And it's it's because I'm trying to decide whether I actually do want to do a final cable crossing before I get to the shoulder. The original sweater didn't have that cable crossing and it did create a wider seam line. This sweater construction between the underarm and the shoulder is quite different than a sw any sweater construction I have knit before. It's really a hybrid of a drop shoulder sweater construction and a set in sleeve construction. So the way the shaping is done is different than I'm used to. And I think all of that combines with the way that this shoulder was constructed to create something that does fit well. I wore this sweater for more than 10 years and the fit was fine. I liked it just fine. So my concern is that if I were to change what's going on at the shoulder to prevent that stretch, that that is going to affect the fit in a way that is detrimental because I think this amount of stretch is needed in order to make the rest of this work. That's what I'm thinking. So I'm going to wait to do the shoulder shaping until the back and both fronts are done and then I'll make a decision. And there's another reason why I think it might be a good idea to not cross near the shoulder. So these cables are crossing to the right. On the back, which I have decided to leave with all of the cables crossing to the right, there's no V-neck interrupting it to cause that to look weird. But the problem with having all of the cables crossing to the right on the back but only having some crossing to the right on the front while the others are crossing to the left is what happens when the two shoulders meet. So these are crossing to the right here and these are crossing to the right here. So they're kind of going in opposite directions of each other rel relative to each other. They're both crossing to the right but relative to each other when they meet. One is crossing that way and one is crossing the other way where if you have a cable right here that's crossing to the left, so it's crossing toward the neck, and this cable is crossing to the right, again, toward the neck, then you have two that are, you know, appear to be crossing in the same direction, like toward each other, creating a V. But if I keep that final crossing away from the shoulder, then you won't have that sort of visual disruption that you would have if you had a final crossing up near the shoulder. So I think I'm going to um, keep this kind of length up here because I think the construction of the sweater kind of requires it to be able to stretch that way and I want to keep my distance um, of the, the cables crossings away from the shoulders. So I mentioned last week that what got me started actually knitting the sweater instead of getting stuck in some of my design decisions and, and challenges was realizing that I really could just make all of these cross in the same direction on the back and on the sleeves and it would, it would actually work out really well that the only need to mirror was on the front. I think maybe some people thought that I wished I could mirror them on the back and so they were offering suggestions and actually I was I'm actually very happy and pleased with this decision because 
I, I realized what, what was causing me to be stuck. Here's a type of cabled sweater that I typically like to work with because I like really complex cable patterns. The more cables, the better. So this one on reverse engineering is unusual because the cables are so simple and repetitive. What I'm used to is a kind of cable design where you have a central panel going up the center. So this was a sweater designed by Janet Zaba. It was part of this Follow the Leader Aaron Knit Along that I participated in back in 2005. And it was a really nice bridge project between uh, just following somebody else's pattern and learning to design on your own. Because she selected all of the cables and then she walked, uh, walked us through the process of how do you measure for yourself? How do you approach, you know, uh, figuring out what kind of neckline you want? Do you want a, a, a crew neck or a v-neck? Do you want a pullover or a cardigan? And so she selected these cables and the layout based on the flexibility of this being either a pullover or a uh, cardigan. In her original design, all three of these central cables all went in the same direction. They were all, I think, uh, pointing up in this direction. And I just decided I'm gonna flip this one and make that a little bit more interesting. If this had been a cardigan, then the center panel right here would have been taken out and replaced by the button band and the buttonhole band. So, and you would still have this cable on either side of the bands. And so the front and the back would have worked really well together. But in this type of design, you have this really wide center panel that is kind of, it takes up a good portion of the width of the neck. And then the rest of the design goes up to almost to the point where the shoulders end that you, you want to have a little bit of this filler stitch on the edge. And so the filler stitch is something where it's very easy to add extra stitches in ones or twos. And that's where you would have your underarm shaping would dig into those filler stitches. And then you just have a little bit of them over on the left and you would never have to, it, it, to um, merge into any of the, the cable patterns and try to, to handle them that way. So that is a, that's that's a approach and it's an approach that I use quite a bit because I like this type of sweater. So this is that really wide center panel and then these are much narrower. So some, some of them might be, you know, an inch or two wide and some of them might be, you know, quite, quite narrow. Like uh, these little ones are, are pretty narrow. They're only two stitch cables right here. So there's a variety of cables and, and they move symmetrically away these rope cables could be done exactly the same or they could be done symmetrically or uh, mirrored, which is what I did. I had this one going out that way while that one's going this way. They didn't have to be, they could have been exactly the same. Uh, these cables right here are all little two stitch cables. They, they both cross in the same direction. They're not, um, these are not mirrored at all. So, and then these are cables that look the same um, regardless. So there's no mirroring of, of those. They're mirrored within the cable itself. So these are all things that, that you think about when, when you're mirroring something like this. With a design like this, the central panel is, mo is the most elaborate and, it bring, and the eye is looking uh, toward this center area. In something like this, we've got panels that are all exactly the same width. And so this central panel isn't any bigger than the other two. In order to make a central panel, you'd actually have to do something with all three of these. And remember, they have to meet at the shoulders with the other uh, existing pa uh, patterns that are on the front. You need to, I at least I like to, it's not a law, but I want the cables on the front to to meet the cables on the back so that they're not offset from each other and um, that they all work together. So the only way to really make a, a central panel in here that would serve the design, that would, that would draw the eye and not bore it, is to have something a little bit more elaborate. And you can't do that when this panel is the same width as the other ones. So a couple of people say, well, what if you just did stockinette up there, would that work? Yeah, it would work, you know, functionally in terms of it would allow these to be mirrored toward there, but it would just be a column of stockinette. It's not, 
terribly interesting. And to me, the benefit of getting the mirroring is not met with the, the cost of having something kind of boring up the center. A couple of people suggested, well, this brioche, which is used for the front ribbing, couldn't you do this center panel in brioche? The problem with that is with the difference in gauges. So here's a stockinette swatch and here's a cable swatch. So you can see how a cable swatch is a lot narrower because it pulls the, the gauge in. It's a lot narrower than the stockinette, but they're the same height in terms of rows. You could have a column of stockinette and it would be fine with, with whatever you were doing with your cables. It just wouldn't be very interesting. But if you had something that was done in brioche, the problem is that, that they don't have the same row gauge. So if you were trying to do this central panel in brioche, first of all, it would be a lot thicker uh, dimensionally this way and it would be pulling down that way. So that, that kind of a, of, of a change wouldn't really work either. Again, I'm not unhappy with this at all. It was like, it was this realization of, oh, this is why you couldn't get it to work. It's because these are all exactly the same. There is no difference in variety and, and any central panel is going to bring the eye toward there and you don't want something that is going to be sort of boring compared to whatever is going around and that's why I decided that it was fine if they all cross in the same direction. Last week I was telling you about the my upcoming plans for my next vintage sweater project uh, which will be from the 1970s. It'll be part of my long-term project of knitting a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. I'm up through 1960s so far and I wanted to do a little something different. Oh, I'm always looking for doing something different in each decade. Uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm looking to learn new things. And what I wanted to do for the 1970s was to use Elizabeth Zimmerman's approach to designing your own sweater. So I'm going to use the instructions that she has in Knitting Without Tears for the approach to uh, designing using what most people or fans of Elizabeth Zimmerman call EPS, Elizabeth's Percentage System. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the overhead and, and I'll uh, explain a little bit about that. But when I was talking about this last week, I was also saying that I was wondering about sources for uh, stranded color work stitch patterns that might have been available in the 1970s uh, because uh, the, the sweater I'll be knitting will be a ski sweater is how she describes it and it's in stranded color work and I was trying to figure out what sorts of stitch dictionaries or other resources would have been available in the 1970s because most stitch dictionaries including the Barbara Walker treasuries were mostly texture or they were a different type of color work they weren't stranded color work and I specifically want to do stranded color work I don't want to do mosaic or slip stitch patterning or any other sort of color work I, I really want to do stranded color work for a couple of reasons. There are a, a few things that I want to uh, learn. I'm always looking to learn something new. There's a couple of things that I want to do in this project that I have learned in the past in a class but have never actually applied to a project. And one of those is a couple of different styles for doing stranded color work. I typically hold one yarn in each hand and it works okay. And I've really struggled to try to hold both of them in the same hand. I've tried different tools. I've tried different uh, ways of tensioning. I've tried a lot of different things that nothing quite clicked for me. And as a knitter, I've learned over the years that there's always a lot of different ways of doing something and you have to find the one that's going to work for you because what works really well for one person is just not going to work well for another. So Trish on Fiber Love Diary has a way of handling both yarns in her left hand that is different from anything I've seen before and looks really promising. It's like, I just look at that and I go, oh, that really has potential, I think. So I need to practice it. And then the other one is a uh, Portuguese knitting, which I took a class on years ago uh, that included Portuguese knitting as a way of dealing with uh, two colors. And I thought, oh, that, that looks really interesting. And I also just like learning completely different knitting styles so that in the event that I get like, um, 
achy joints or arthritis that there are ways of switching to a different style in order to just make my body uh, feel a little bit better. So I wanna do strand of color work and I wanna try a couple of knitting styles. And then I also wanna do sticking, which again, I learned in a class, never used in an actual project. So there are a couple of things that I'm, I'm wanting to, to do during the course of uh, knitting this project. And one of the things that I was curious about was where to find uh, these strand of color work patterns if they aren't in sort of these traditional stitch dictionaries that normally just focus on texture or other types of color work that isn't stranded. So I got a lot of different ideas from people and I'm very grateful. Um, I have a couple of used books on their, their way to me. And I also re remembered that I had a book in my own library that I'd forgotten about that could be useful. And then one of my viewers sent me a whole box full of craft publications from the 1970s. So I'm gonna open that box in the overhead and show you. And then I will also kind of explain the process that Elizabeth Zimmerman uh, presents to knitters in terms of designing your own sweater, this Elizabeth's percentage system and what that means and, and kind of uh, what it looks like. So we're gonna go to the overhead uh, to show you those things. So I'm excited to see what is in this. I was promised some 1970s magazines. Oh, these are large format magazines. So let's uh, turn them over and take a look at them. Okay, so these are called Needle, McCall's Needlework and Crafts. So McCall's was a women's magazine. Certainly had heard of that. We didn't, my mom didn't subscribe to any magazines like this when I was a kid back in the 70s. She was in graduate school getting her PhD and she subscribed to Scientific American and Ms. Magazine. Those were the two things. She was a divorced mother with two kids in graduate school in the 70s. So that's what she was into. These have all kinds of different uh, items in the, these. And what Deborah thought was that I might be interested in some of these 1970s magazines that they, oh, that was actually really pretty. What was this? These crocheted shawls. She thought that there might be some stranded color work patterns in here that like stitch patterns that would be part of, oh, look at that. I always like a shawl collar. Oh, look at that, it's got pockets. It's my, <laughs> it's got a, a belt. This is my kind of, um, that's my kind of a sweater. So there's all kinds of things in here. There's a quilting and needlepoint and uh, all kinds of embroidery, all kinds of things. That was something I did do as a kid was embroider. I had a pair of overalls that I embroidered with all kinds of things. So these are really cool. So this one, this is from spring, summer, 1975. This is fall, winter, 74, 75. It's interesting to see, oh, look, they got a knitting machine. <laughs> that, oh my God, that's so 70s. Look at that crocheted maxi skirt in earth tones. It's a nice cabled sweater. They got some nice stuff in here, some stuff that's pretty timeless. So, oh, look, here's some stranded color work right here. Uh, this is a yoke style. Oh, baby stuff never goes out of style. There's a lot of this. Oh, my God. Some of this stuff is just so funny. Oh, look, they've got stained glass. They've got all kinds of stuff. So these are uh, pretty cool. Advertisement for learning to upholster. Big profits in upholstery is what this promises bottle cutter. Boy, this really has all kinds of crafts in it. So I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's cake decorating, tube paint, beads. Crafts with Katie TV show. I don't remember that one. Liquid embroidery. Boy, this is, this is fascinating. So, oh, I kind of like that sweater. So these are great. I'm going to have to take my time going through these, but uh, these are fantastic. Oh, and there's some stranded color work right here. I uh, really appreciate this. This is fantastic. The reason I'm looking for 1970s sources for stranded color work patterns is because my next vintage project will be a stranded color work sweater 
uh, using the EPS or Elizabeth's percentage system. It's Elizabeth Zimmerman. Uh, she explains it in her book, Knitting Without Tears. She's explained it in a few other places too. This isn't the only source for her system, but she has in here the idea of a ski sweater that you could make using stranded color work. And she explains, you know, what the process is for doing that. And one of them, she provides some stranded color work stitch patterns if you want to use those. I may very well end up using the stitch patterns that she provides, but I was interested in what other sources would have been available in the 1970s. So the way that the Elizabeth percentage system works is that you, you start with the idea of your, your basic sweater, the body of your sweater, what is that circumference going to be? And then whatever that is, then the upper arm of the sleeve is going to be like 45% of that. And then the lower part of the sleeve is going to be something like, I don't know these numbers off the top of my head, like 25%. And then there may be another basic circumference measurement for the head that, or the neck opening. That's what the, her percentage system is, is that you determine what you want the body circumference to be. And then you can use a percentage of that to determine what the armhole will be and then what the wrist will be. The ski sweater that she has in there has ba the most basic sweater sweater construction shaping that that you can have um, and it's it's what's called a drop shoulder so it basically means that the body is a rectangle there's no underarm shaping at all that it's you are knitting a tube so you're knitting a tube in stranded color work all the way up you're not separating from the underarms once you get up to where you want the shoulders to be then you um, you can machine sew around where you want to make the opening but you just cut through the stitches down to the depth of the underarm that you want uh, and then I don't know if she mentions a facing or not but there are typically uh, you knit a facing on the inside to hide those those edges and you're going to want to use a type of wool that's going to be conducive to this sort of thing like a woolen spun wool not a super wash wool and probably you know a worsted wool spun wool would probably be okay but woolen spun would work best because the fibers are going in all different directions and they're going to be stickier and it's going to be less likely to uh, want to ravel. You make this tube and then you cut the openings and then you have the sleeves that get either um, sewn into it or you could pick up it here and then knit that way. If you knit this going in this direction, the stitches will be upside down relative to that. So if, if you were knitting this direction, your color work uh, stitches, would the Vs would look like that. Um, and they would look like this um, going in that direction. And some knitting traditions are completely okay with that and other knitting traditions think that's the worst thing you could possibly do. So obviously it's personal preference. I think Elizabeth's percentage system is going to work just fine for me because the standard pattern sizing tends to work for me as well and these percentages align pretty well with standard sizing. I am going to take a closer look at some of her other sweater constructions to see how she might modify the uh, Elizabeth percentage system for different types of sweaters. So typically there are changes in some circumferences, particularly when it comes to the armhole depth. Different types of sweaters will have different types of armhole depths, and I'm interested to see how she might handle this differently. If this sort of concept is interesting to you, uh, you might be interested in uh, this book here, which is called Knitting in the Old Way. It has a similar approach to figuring out how to proportion traditional sweaters of different types. So you'll have Norwegian sweaters, uh, you'll have Icelandic sweaters, you'll have Fair Isle sweaters, all different types of sweaters that might have particular types of construction elements, yoke style sweaters of all different types are in here. So uh, they explain how to uh, proportion those sweaters as well as give you guidelines for how to work those constructions. So this is a really good uh, book for that type of approach to designing your own sweaters. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, please leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.